introduce um, uh, Dean uh, Larry Larson. <clears throat> He's the Dean of Engineering at Brown University. And you can read his bio in here. But I saw an article he wrote in an IEEE publication about a year, year and a half ago. And it was a really, for me, it was a very interesting article because he touched on a subject that a lot of people don't talk about, which is, okay, great, we got all these great ideas for using spectrum in a different way, but who's going to design the chips and who's going to design the receiver front ends and the transmitter front ends to do this stuff? So what Dean Larson has done is he's actually analyzed this in this article. And he's got a lot of slides, so we're probably going to move kind of quickly. But um, we'll, we'll allow uh, 10 minutes at the end for, for you to question him. So if he's ready to go, uh, I'll go to the first slide. Okay, are we ready? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, coming to my talk this afternoon, and I do apologize that a family emergency uh, has kept me from the conference, but I really want to deeply uh, thank the conference organizers for letting me present this talk remotely. And uh, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about the challenges of um, kind of at the hardware level for future radio uh, spectrum access. And uh, next slide, slide two. Um, you all are, I'm sure, very familiar with this chart. This is the uh, U.S. frequency spectrum chart going from sort of DC to light. And um, it's, uh, you know, completely allocated at this point pretty much, both with licensed and unlicensed, um, you know, uh, services. And the question, and there's really no room kind of at the end for um, new services, for new waveforms, for new types of wireless devices of all kinds. And so the question that we kind of have to confront ourselves with is, well, how do we um, create this next generation of wireless services with a spectrum that's really already spoken for? And, you know, the U.S. government, I think, has done a very good job over the last several decades of auctioning off unused spectrum and trying to reallocate spectrum for this explosion in services that are that are necessary for the world. Uh, it, but the result of this is that modern wireless devices, you know, whether it's your cell phone or Wi-Fi or you know almost any any kind of uh, uh, you know kind of broad uh, high data rate kind of device, has to address a very wide range of spectrum, and the ranges of spectra that these devices have to address is getting larger and larger all the time. If you open up a cell phone today and look inside of it, you'll see a whole bank of soft filters, each customized to a given you know, band of interest. And so what are the hardware uh, challenges that result from this new uh, spectrum uh, you know, paradigm? And you know, how, how, what, kind of rate, what are radios going to look like, say, 10 or 20 years in the future, where they have to address even broader and broader bandwidths? So that's... Um, what I'm going to be talking about in this in this talk, and let's go to slide number three. And the, fir the first uh, uh, couple of slides that I give you are going to be kind of spectrum uh, focused. And a good place to start when we talk about spectrum is always the uh, you know the Radio Act of 1912, which came about actually as, as a result of the Titanic. And uh, the Radio Act of 1912 specified you know that that stations would be given certain uh, frequency bands or certain wavelengths and that they would not, you know, deviate outside of those, those bands. And that's really the basis of the uh, chopped up spectrum allocation that we, that we live with today. And the, there are many, many great, you know, economic and social consequences of this that resulted really, I think, in the, in the wireless industry we see today, which is spectacular, you know, low-cost consumer nodes, uh, there's assured quality of service, which is especially important for public safety applications. You know, a police band is given a certain band, and no one is allowed to intrude into that. Um, the, the, this is, the bad things of this are the inefficient, relatively inefficient use of spectrum. And if you're um, uh, allocated a certain frequency band, in many cases there's little incentive for delivery of new services and technology. Uh, technically, what that means is that the mobile terminals can be pretty dumb, 
uh, they don't have to have much awareness of where they are or you know what the environment is that they live in. And uh, things like frequency and modulation and receivers are pretty much set at the time of the manufacturer. So uh, this is the world that we live in today, you know, fixed uh, spectrum allocation uh, with uh, frequency division between different kinds of services and devices, uh, slide four. So let's take a look at some of the problems uh, in a little more concrete fashion that have resulted from this. And of course, I think we're, we're all very familiar with the TV bands. And so the TV bands are a great kind of a case study of uh, the opportunities and the, and the problems that we have with our existing spectrum allocation. And then, you know, what, then that I think will lead to a discussion of what kind of radios we might want to build in the future. So here is uh, some data from 2003. It's a little old now that shows uh, spectrum usage in the 700 to 900 megahertz range, 700 to 800 megahertz range in Washington, D.C. area. This is the UHF TV band. And, you know, what you see, you know, both as a function of time and as a function of spectrum is that these bands are very, very lightly used you know, during the day. You know, sort of 2% of the spectrum that is nominally allocated for use is actually being used at any given time. And this is from, you know, DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., which is a very, you know, vibrant urban environment. And despite that, the, we have 100 megahertz here of spectrum that's still hardly used at all throughout the day. So, uh, you know, think of the wonderful services that could be, you know, wide data rate services that could be provided in the spectrum if it were more, um, you know, um, efficiently allocated. Uh, next slide, slide five. And so actually now taking... Uh, a little more detail from that uh, NAS study, uh, looking at frequency bands from 30 megahertz up to um, uh, 800, 900 megahertz. And what you see is that, you know, some bands are well used, uh, some bands are hardly used at all, and uh, it's just kind of a hodgepodge of, um, you know, different uh, allocation percentages and different, you know, times throughout the day. So. Uh, from this study, roughly 80% of the spectrum between 30 megahertz and a gigahertz was unused at, at any given time, you know, on average during the day. So that's a, once again, that's a dead weight loss, that's an economic loss that, that we all suffer. And if we had um, services that could better utilize this spectrum, if we had radios that could better uh, address it, uh, there'd be tremendous economic growth and great technical opportunity. Um, Slide, five, let's see, next slide, slide six, I guess, shows um, another way of kind of cutting this. This is in three different cities now, uh, Atlanta, New Orleans, and San Diego, uh, frequency on the x-axis and time on the y-axis, and the color is a uh, indication of the intensity of the usage. And what you can kind of see here is, that, you know, in most cities in the U.S., uh, the spectrum is lightly used, uh, in, in most bands, but in the bands where it is used, it's used continuously throughout the day. You know, San Diego, my old hometown, is one of the uh, kind of counter examples where the spectrum is quite widely used, you know, throughout the day. So the spectrum usage, just sort of empirically, is uh, inconsistent. It's uh, scattered, uh, scattered geographically, scattered in time, and scattered in frequency. So next slide. Uh, how can we take advantage of this? Well, as, as you all probably know, you know, the uh, FCC has been reallocating uh, so-called TV white spaces for many years now, and that process is, you know, ongoing and uh, very much, uh, you know, kind of in, in progress. And uh, the services that are being created around these TV white spaces kind of fall into two categories. There's an 802.22, these are IEEE standards, IEEE 802.22, which is a kind of a wide area network uh, standard that has been developed for um, the TV bands. And uh, the 802.11 AF standard, which is a local area network standard being used for kind of local area network uh, types of applications. And um, the, um, so, the, so th th these are focused on the TV, so-called TV band. And, you know, th th there's lots of kind of churn in these standards and, uh, you know, flux going on. So what I'm going to give you is kind of a snapshot from a couple of years ago of where uh, the thinking was on some of these. So 
uh, at, at the there, there are two different types of services. There's a fixed service, which is kind of a high power service, and uh, one lot, a uh, full lot EIRP. And then there's a portable service, which is uh, kind of 40 milliwatts EIRP. And um, the restriction is that for these for these large uh, high power fixed services, you have to be at least one channel away from a TV band. From an, you have to be more than one away from a TV band. And uh, for per, for a portable device, you have to be in an unoccupied band. And so um, these this table here on the slide. Uh, you know, number seven shows the uh, general kind of restrictions. You know, there, there are some channels that are reserved for radio astronomy, wireless mics, um, it, but, but still quite a few channels, you know, each one six megahertz wide, which could be very, very useful for a variety of wireless services. Now, it's quite wide in spectrum, right? It's several hundred megahertz in spectrum. So whatever radio we build is going to, first of all, have to tune over a very, very wide bandwidth with, with, with uh, incredible sensitivity, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a bit. Uh, so, so how um, widespread can we, can we use these um, TV bands? And once again, this is some data from Steve Shellhammer at Qualcomm. Um, you know, it, it will vary depending on the city. New York has a relatively, for example, New York has a relatively dense uh, TV environment, and so the number of channels available for fixed or portable services is rather limited. Um, Chicago is, has fewer channels, and therefore more are available. Uh, so I think the point is, you know, the radio, so, so there's another point, whatever radio you deploy that takes advantage of these services is going to have to uh, be location aware. And in fact, when people do a, a kind of a, a channel availability, you know, what they see is that different urban markets have different numbers of uh, available channels, either for personal or portable, and that's shown in um, uh, slide number nine. Uh, what slide number nine shows is that you know, major metropolitan areas in this country have highly varying numbers of fixed uh, channels available for, uh, you know, these TV band types of operations. Uh, if we go to slide 10, uh, and we kind of do a histogram of all the available urban areas in the country, or at least the major urban areas, 50, 50 largest cities. And we look at uh, the white space availability for portable low power devices or, or uh, fixed high power devices. You know, what you see is that there's a, you know, quite a standard deviation of available channels. You know, maybe 20 white spaces is kind of a mean for, um, Portable devices and maybe you know 10, 10 uh, white spaces is available for for uh, fixed high power devices. So there's a great opportunity here. You know, at six megahertz per channel, if you have say 20 channels available, that's 120 megahertz. It's a huge a huge swath of spectrum available for all kinds of great great stuff. Now, once again, the um, location that you deploy these services. Uh, will determine the available channels. And so that means that uh, geolocation is necessary for um, uh, widespread deployment of these systems. And uh, once again, this is from the FCC, uh, you know, um, requirements will be a geolocation database, uh, which, you know, several companies are kind of working on at the moment. Um, your location should be noted within 50 meters. Uh, if it's a portable device and uh, the time of installation, if it's a fixed device. And of course, there's some problems with this. You know, sometimes indoor GPS isn't reliable. And, uh, you know, even outdoor GPS can occasionally be, lead you astray. So this is, uh, one of the things that, uh, has to be considered if we do, if we widely deploy these systems. So, so that's a little bit of the background. The spectrum, there's spectrum available across a very wide range of frequencies that is available for wireless services of all kinds, fixed, mobile, high power, low power. Uh, the, so there's a tremendous kind of opportunity here, which we're gradually beginning to exploit. Uh, and so, but what effect does this have on radio requirements? What, you know, where does the radio fit into this? And so if we go to slide number 12, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. So the, so the first problem is that we're uh, building a radio that has to coexist with uh, commercial TV systems. And 
so one of the classic problems that we're going to have here is the, uh, the classic near-far problem, which in this case is a cognitive radio device that is trying to listen to a very quiet little signal, uh, and yet that cognitive radio device is right next to a TV broadcasting station. It's, it's beaming out the TV receivers all over the, all over the place. And uh, so, you know, it turns out that, you know, the TV signal could be as large as, as minus 8 dBm at that cognitive radio device. But uh, you, might, you may want to uh, have a receiver in the cognitive radio device that has a sensitivity level of like minus 102 dBm. And so there's this tremendous dynamic range between the desired signal and the blocking signal. And uh, so that, you know, actually, if you compare this to, say, a very challenging environment like a cell phone environment, this is much tougher than traditional cell phone uh, devices. Uh, TV broadcasting stations typically broadcast much, much higher power than a uh, cell phone tower. So uh, this is one, you know, one kind of big problem, you know, the blocking problem of, a, of an adjacent uh, TV signal. Uh, that, that compresses the receiver and the cognitive radio device that has to have a very, very uh, tough sensitivity. So the next slide, uh, so that's, that's the kind of a blocking problem. The next slide shows the, uh, another hardware-related problem uh, with these cognitive radio devices. It's really kind of a result of the same thing, the um, classic uh, reciprocal mixing problem of uh, high dynamic range receivers means that the phase noise of the uh, local oscillator down converts uh, the TV signal into the band, into the desired band of interest. And um, the uh, resulting phase noise specs uh, for, a cognitive, for a receiver that would have to receive this, this high of a dynamic range are uh, really, really, really tough. And so, um, much, once again, much kind of tougher than traditional cell phone uh, phase noise specs. And, uh, you know, in this kind of admittedly very simple case that, that we show here, uh, the phase noise would have to be like 135 dBc per hertz at 100 kilohertz off the, off the carrier. Uh, this example that we show here uh, illustrates the, the need for tunable filtering, which I'll get to a little bit later. You know, if, if you put a notch filter in front of the mixer, uh, that, that tunes out the TV band. Uh, it reduces the phase noise requirements on the local oscillator by a considerable degree. And so that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we'll see again and again as we talk about the hardware requirements. So that a really good tunable filter is a key enabling technology for these really, really broadband receivers that have, have to operate in, in what are hostile environments by any measure. Slide 14 shows another problem. Let's imagine that you have two um, transmitters, uh, two TV transmitters, and they uh, both are transmitting simultaneously while you're trying to listen to a uh, cognitive radio white space device. And once again, these two receivers, um, uh, sorry, these two uh, TV channels will intermodulate with each other, potentially. Um, and down convert into the white space band. And the resulting uh, IIP3, if you just kind of do it back to the envelope calculation, is about plus 20 dBm. So that's pretty tough for a low power, let's imagine you're trying to build a low power wireless receiver like something for a cell phone. You know, a 20 dBm IIP3 is really, really tough. Uh, so once again, um, how do you build this in a low cost consumer device? Uh, some kind of tunable RF front end filter is probably going to be necessary to make this work. Um, and then similarly, if we're doing simultaneous transmit and receive, uh, and we go out through some kind of a circulator or duplexer filter, uh, the transmit signal could cross modulate with a jammer and land in the desired band of interest. And, you know, once again, this implies uh, very, very high required isolation between the transmit and, and uh, receiver in a, in a full duplex system or, you know, time division duplexing or, you know, some other technique to, to minimize this effect. So, uh, the, you know, the classic problems that you see in, in high dynamic range receiver design, blocking, phase noise, intermodulation, and cross-modulation, all of these are 
doubly or triply important in, in, a, in a high dynamic range cognitive radio or TV band receiver. Uh, now, so that's the receiver. Now, on the transmit side, things are very tough too. Uh, what we what we see here is the uh, FCC mask required spectral mask for the fixed device in the TV band, and uh, oh, that's on uh, the signal flight 16. Sorry, and overlaid on the black requirement is the red transmit mask for OFDM in 802.11, which is the standard Wi-Fi kind of uh, transmit mask. And what you see here is that in order to in order to keep from corrupting adjacent cognitive radio bands, the transmitters in these TV band devices have to be really linear. There can be no spectral regrowth, and the noise source has to be way, way down. So um, not only does the receiver have to be very linear, and very, with a very high dynamic range, but the transmitters have to be very linear and have a high dynamic range as well. Slide 17 shows the same spectral mask for the um, uh, portable devices, the lower power devices. And even for these lower power devices, the spec, which is in black, is much tougher than the uh, Wi-Fi band, the 802.11 Wi-Fi. Uh, so, um, uh, linear, you know, uh, transmitters, which put out watts or hundreds of milliwatts of power, are going to be required in order to operate in these uh, in these frequency regimes. Uh, or, or that's a real hardware challenge uh, to make these low cost and efficient, and uh, you know, appropriate for a consumer application. Slide 18, I think, just kind of summarizes some of the things that we've talked about here. The um, uh, for these future you know, multi-spectral, very wide dynamic range radios. Um, the spectrum is widely available in space and time. Uh, the receivers and transmitters have to map onto the available spectrum, and the available spectrum is location dependent. Uh, you'll probably want to have independent tuning of transmit and receive frequencies because you never know where, where you're going to land. You know, you never know what you're going to have available to you. You're going to need very high linearity receivers and very high linearity and wideband transmitters. So if you go to the next slide, slide 19, um, this now goes down one further level to talk about what, what the specs are kind of at the, at the radio level. And the specs for these devices are really tough and really exciting. Uh, you know, very wide tunable bandwidth, um, very high linearity receiver, high linearity low power amplifiers, uh, high, high, extremely linear power amplifiers. Of course, it has to be low cost for consumer applications. And I think a key enabling technology is uh, tunable passive filters of all kinds. I'll talk a little bit about MEMS, but there are a variety of uh, options. And then, you know, really high linearity wideband power amplifiers and a digital pre distortion is probably a key technology there. So uh, we'll talk about some of these in the next few slides. So let's go to slide 20. Uh, you know, first of all, I think that um, the, the key, the name, one key enabling technology, especially on the receive side, is the ability to tune at a very high quality, uh, low loss uh, filter. And you know, RF MEMS devices are the best devices in the world for this type of, you know, wide dynamic range, you know, highly linear tuning. Uh, these are some great pictures from my colleague at UC San Diego, Professor Gabriel Rodriguez, that shows that, uh, you know, basically an RF MEMS is sort of like a perfect switch at uh, microwave frequencies. You know, even up to 50 gigahertz, they display you know, just incredibly low loss and incredibly excellent isolation when they're, when they're open. Uh, slide 21 shows how these switches can be used to build really good filters in the microwave, tunable filters in the microwave frequency range. And in this case, uh, a filter was built from 6 to 10 gigahertz, and of course they've been built at higher frequencies and lower frequencies. But um, here at 6 to 10 gigahertz, uh, a filter with just a few dB of loss, you know, essentially infinite linearity because it's a metal-to-metal -metal contact and outstanding isolation in the out-of-band frequency range. So if we think about enabling technologies to build these really high-performance tunable radios 
these RFMIMS devices are, are a great example. If we go to the next slide, which is slide 22, you know, another really important technology is um, smart antennas, and uh, I should maybe say electronically scannable antennas. And this technology has recently become, you know, extremely commonplace at the upper frequency, upper microwave frequency ranges. Um, you know, I've, I've been told that, uh, you know, electron, electronically scanned arrays are used on planes now to connect to satellites. So when you're when you're flying across the country, you're you're using uh, electronically scanned arrays. Uh, they're very very common at millimeter waves for a variety of defense applications. And uh, of course, the challenges at lower frequencies are tough because of space requirements. But nevertheless, if you can steer a beam in a certain direction electronically using electronically scanning electronic scanning techniques. Uh, your ability to operate, it, you know, in an, your ability to null out an interferer, which is a classic cognitive radio problem, is vastly enhanced. So, uh, electronic scanning in order to null out interference issues, both on the transmit and the receive side, is going to be a very integral part of this technology. Next slide. And so, um, what are these? Smart antennas uh, offer, or electrically scanning antennas offer, they offer uh, enhanced gain, uh, angle reuse, and spatial multiplexing. Uh, next slide. And uh, there, there's been some really, really good work on this. You know, uh, this uh, next slide shows some work from Toshiba, and there's, there's been a lot of other work on this uh, at, at a variety of frequencies, but, um, uh, you know, even a four element array can give you substantial nulling of interferers and substantial increase in uh, antenna gain. Uh, the next slide shows an example of, um, of phased array technology combined with an RF MEMS technology. So you use the RF MEMS to uh, switch in various phase shifters. And uh, the very phase shifter uh, allows you to steer the beam in an appropriate direction. Once again, this is from my colleague at the UCSD, Professor Obey. Uh, slide uh, 20, uh, so the next slide shows some electronic techniques for canceling interference. Uh, and there's a classic problem even in cell phones today. You know, duplexer losses, um, duplexers do not provide perfect isolation between transmit and receive. And so any kind of technology that will uh, null out an interfering transmitter signal uh, can allow a real reduction in duplexer requirements and an improvement in performance. So here's an example of an adaptive filter that was built uh, by uh, Vladimir Perrin at Qualcomm. And this adaptive filter basically cancels out uh, transmitter interference leakage at the output of the LNA. And uh, so it basically takes an estimate of the transmitter, uh, appropriately sums it and phase shifts it, and then subtracts it from the output of the LNA, uh, achieving uh, improved cancellation. So when we think about a problem of cross-modulation in these wideband radios, this is a great technique to potentially solve that. If we go to the next slide, slide 27, another interference canceling receiver. This is a uh, uh, some work that Himanshu Kakri at UCSD did, and basically uh, the amplifier, the mixer and amplifiers highlighted in gray here, uh, present a short circuit impedance at the a tunable, tunable in frequency, short circuit input impedance at the input of those mixers, and you set the um, uh, frequency of the uh, low impedance to the uh, down converted transmit frequency and it nulls that out because it's a low impedance at that frequency. And so uh, this is another example of using uh, a tunable impedance to cancel out the interference in a, uh, in a very broad band receiver. Uh, the next slide I think, which, which is kind of where I'm going to finish off the discussion, what we're looking for in these wideband radios is a, is a really broadband uh, tunable filter. And uh, mixers have a wonderful, passive mixers have a wonderful frequency translation property. You know, whatever impedance you put at the output of a passive mixer is, is up-converted to the uh, local oscillator frequency. 
And this was used many, many years ago by the people at Bell Labs to create so-called NPAF filters, which are basically tunable short circuits. And um, this technique has recently been uh, kind of rediscovered by a variety of groups and is now actually beginning to appear in commercial microwave products for interference canceling or interference rejection uh, applications. And if we go to the next slide, which I think is slide 29, uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things with, with passive mixers whose LO frequency tunes to a desired frequency. So on slide 29, I show you an example of a tunable notch filter, where if you put a parallel LC at the output of a passive mixer, you can build a tunable notch filter uh, at the input of the mixer by tuning the local oscillator of the local oscillator frequency. And uh, on slide 30, I show some examples of how you can tune from sort of 500 to 700 megahertz and get extremely, uh, you know, great uh, notch, notching, uh, um, you know, rejection. And, you know, the beauty of this is you can tune it over a broad frequency range. So as, the, as you move your cognitive radio device, uh, it can tune to the interference frequency that is being detected in that particular area. If we go to slide 31, uh, you can do the opposite trick. You can put, you can terminate the uh, passive mixer just with a capacitor, and now you have a tunable bandpass filter. So you can uh, tune the LO of the mixer to your desired frequency, the frequency that you want to listen to, and then the uh, impedance looking into that mixer is a short, basically anywhere kind of outside the local oscillator range. And in particular, this uh, RF tunable bandpass filter technique is, is being used pretty widely now to build a very high dynamic range, tunable bandpass filters that cover several hundred megahertz of range, you know, at very low, very low losses, uh, at least, you know, in an integrated circuit kind of environment. So, so if we go to slide 32, I think I'd just like to conclude by saying that I think there's this really exciting new world that's going to be opening up in the next decade where we have commercial, you know, consumer grade radios that tune over an incredibly wide range of frequencies that basically go from sort of 100 megahertz up to 60 gigahertz. And I haven't even talked about millimeter waves in this, in this talk, but, but they'll, they'll be sort of going almost DC to light. And with a very small form factor and a very um, low cost kind of a consumer level um, kind of cost. But there are some real radio innovations that are required to do this. They have to be, of course, tunable over this incredible bandwidth. Uh, the radios will have to be very high linear, highly linear. Uh, the power amplifiers that are transmitting will have to be very linear. And we'll have to use these innovative new filtering techniques to build low power and low cost and, and high, levels, high levels of integration for consumer applications. And that concludes my talk. I want to thank you all very much. And once again, I'm, I'm so sorry I was not able to join you this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take uh, a few questions from Dean Larson, but I'm going to have to manipulate my phone uh, to do this. Great. Okay, Dean Larson, can you hear me? Okay, good. Hold on, I'm going to turn you up here. Okay, d yeah, good. Okay, does does anybody have a question for for Dean Larson? There's one in the back. John, it's actually more of a comment, and within that decade of bandwidth from the first bullet in his conclusion is virtually all of the public safety bandwidth. Um, and if we, for example, look at the infamous Chicago study of the mid-70s where the FCC got all over the fire service for very ineffective use of the spectrum because they only saw transmissions at 8 a.m. when they were testing all the apparatus, from a public policy and a public and a, a property owner perspective, that was absolutely the best situation because it meant there were no fires. And so if, if we are looking at the public safety shared spectrum in there, the requirement that we must have that spectrum, 
within 10 milliseconds of when we need it and no possibility of interference during the time that we need it across the entire service area of that system, no system that I know of today can meet that requirement in a, sh in a sharing environment. Did you get that, Dean Larson? I, yeah, I, I, I only got kind of every other word, but I, I think that the uh, questioner was raising a really, really good point, which is that uh, public safety um, cannot be compromised in any way through some of these techniques, and uh, we should be very, very careful. John, did I get that kind of correctly? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think the, uh, so we have to proceed extremely, extremely carefully. And, you know, I, I, I like you have heard some horror stories about interference with public safety vans. There, there is a kind of an alternative view of that, which I don't entirely embrace, but I'll, I'll just kind of throw it out as perhaps uh, playing the devil's advocate, which is that, you know, public safety is uh, uh, a secret responsibility that we all have. But um, we have public highways, too, and public highways don't have dedicated lanes for ambulances and fire trucks and police cars. And what happens is that we all know, and there are laws that say that when there's a public safety emergency on a highway, we all pull over, and uh, that has worked pretty well. So if, you know, in the future, not today, but in the future, you know, if radios are given some uh, intelligence and some, um, you know, uh, awareness of their environment and their locale, then perhaps public safety and some of these other services could coexist very nicely in, 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 this, in the same band. We're not there today, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're a long way from there, but uh, there, there are alternative models that would, I think, allow for very strong public safety um, uh, requirements to be fulfilled. Do, do we have any more? It's a, great, it's a great question. It's a great, great and important question. Yeah, there were some people sh shaking their heads, uh, disagreeing <laughs> with you, but um, we're all entitled to our own opinions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, as I said, it's a, it's a devil's advocate uh, perspective. It's not one that I'm advocating. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, uh, Pro Professor or Dean, that, that your uh, qualification is, is accepted. Uh, I think the main point that John was trying to make in the, in the first part was that you started out your presentation by using a spectrum uh, measurement in, in 2003. That's 12, that's a long time ago. And in 700 and 800 megahertz in that time, the spectrum was little utilized because uh, public safety was allocated uh, its 24 megahertz of 700 in 1997. That was only six years later. There were very few systems. Secondly, uh, in 800, in DuPont Circle, I don't know why it chose that, but DuPont Circle was a bad choice because the only 800 megahertz used in public safety in Washington was for fire in those times. And, uh, and, and of course, John explained the, the issue of spectrum utilization. So for that to be used as the basis for spectrum inefficiency, they were just poor uh, examples. That was what we were seeing. Did you get that, Dean Larson? John, I didn't. Perhaps you could summarize it for me. <laughs> yes. So, so the the point is, is that um, uh, a, another speaker, another attendee, rather, Harlan McEwen, who is an ex police chief, said that uh, in Washington D.C. area at that point in time, there was very little use of seven or eight hundred megahertz, other than the fire department. That most people were using the UHFT band, and um, so. The, the, the spectrum usage and white space calculations from, from that area are perhaps leading to an erroneous conclusion. Today, if you were to look at that, uh, in fact, th that spectrum would be much more utilized. Um, but I, I'll just say that I, I, I think what you were tr basically trying to prove was not any specific place, but rather that there is white space available and that, that we need to think about it. I believe that was your point. You, you want to confirm? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not making any particular policy recommendation about any particular urban environment or any particular frequency band. Any other questions for, for Dean Larson? 
No more questions. Okay, Dean, thank you very much. Uh, I know this wasn't easy to do, but uh, we managed to follow the slides along, and I think I only missed you once or twice. Uh, thank you again okay, for your time. And John, I'd like to thank all the attendees for the great questions. Thank you again.